Historical Society on BCTV is supported in part by the Highlands at Wyomissing. Hello and welcome to the monthly program of the Historical Society of Berks County. I'm your host, George M. Miser IX, President Emeritus of the Historical Society of Berks County. It should be noted that this program is telecast live on the first Wednesday of each month at 7. It repeats Friday at 10, Saturday at 6, and Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Welcome all uh, to our January 2011 program. Seated beside me is Kim Richards, Society Archivist, uh, and beside her is Joshua Blay, Associate Director of the Historical Society and Curator of Collections. Hello, George. Good to have you back. Thank you. Our museum and museum store open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now, with the winter weather coming up, keep an eye on WFMZ in case of a winter closure procedures. And I'm not part of the smartphone club yet, but I'm told you can download an application to your smartphone as well from WFMZ. So keep an eye on their website and the, uh, the TV station. And when in doubt, give us a call. Um, the Historical Society Museum Store has a large inventory of Reading and Berks County histories, craft items, and toys. The store also has a wide variety of pottery, artwork, and many craft items by many well-known local artisans and potters. We remind viewers that for $40, you can be one of us, a member of the Historical Society of Berks County. Membership in the Society includes our prize-winning quarterly magazine, The Historical Review of Berks County. Membership includes unlimited use of the museum and library. Incidentally, family memberships, all living in the same house, are only $50 a year. And while we're on the subject of memberships, we remind that those of you at home that Berks Community TV, BC TV, is a survivor in a tough venue and unique entity and that it's interactive. You are encouraged to call with your questions and comments to 610-378-0426. Why not salute BCTV for all the great shows it provides to Reading and Berks and send your check for $30 for the year's membership. Mail your checks to BCTV, 645 Penn Street, Reading 19601. Remember, time passes, but operating expenses never go away. As most viewers of this program are aware, uh, the passing scene, volume 18, has been published uh, <clears throat> and it's now available at the Historical Society of Berks County, 940 Center Avenue, uh, and the price is $48 tax included. Uh, copies can be mailed to any um, uh, address in the United States for $55. And it's also on our PayPal now in our online museum store. And a lot of people are using PayPal. Yeah, we've been sending out a lot of copies out yeah. via PayPal. PayPal is, is very handy. Um, there, there are two autograph sessions. Maybe you can comment on this, Joshua. Sure. There are two autograph sessions coming up. I was indisposed uh, when we were going to have them in November. I, I spent November in the hospital and in bed, so that uh, it wasn't able to, it wasn't able to be part of what we had planned. Uh, we're going to have two autograph parties. Uh, let me see. Is it uh, Saturday, January the 15th? Yep, it's going to be two Saturdays in a row. It's going to be Saturday the 15th and Saturday the 22nd. We're going to start at 9 and go to noon. We're going to break for lunch. Might be pizza, it might be VNS, or it could be um, that Italian place you really like on Pizza Street. Como. Yeah, Pizza Como. Mm -hmm. It could be Pizza Como. Uh, then we're going to go from 1 to 3, so 9 to noon, 1 to 3 on the 15th and also the 22nd. Bring your own sub from Pizza Como. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as an inducement, we're having a, a, a one-day-only uh, arrangement. Musical Remembrances, a uh, wonderful book. It was part of uh, four books that were put out in 1976 by the Berksiana uh, Foundation. I was a part of that. And uh, this is really a wonderful book written by Cedric Nagel Elmer, uh, an old friend of mine and a very good member of the Historical Society for many, many years. Uh, when the Kutztown Publishing Company uh, closed their doors after many, many years of, um, uh, of operation, they, closed, uh, they sold the business and they emptied the warehouse. And it just so happened uh, that they had a number of books left. And I became the proud recipient of 
quite a few boxes of these musical remembrances and is at the point now where uh, I'm desperate for a little space. So, on January the 15th, one to th uh, 9 to 12, 1 to 3, um, th while supplies last, uh, the first 100 people who buy a book will get one of these uh, gratis. If you would like a copy and you buy a book on the 15th, uh, you may have one of these. These, by the way, uh, 176 pages, and this really is a wonderful book. Uh, Cedric Elmer did two books uh, on on the composers and the musicians, uh, the, the artists of Berks County, did uh, a great deal of wonderful work. And the real value of this book is that when Cedric worked on this in 1976, uh, there were a number of the old time folks still around uh, in advanced age. Shortly after this book was done, and that actually happened with the second book as well, uh, so many of the people who were, uh, who were detailed in here uh, who were very much involved with compositions and, and uh, mainly compositions, they, they passed away, uh, I bet you, within 10 years. Perhaps we should contact our good friend Cedric for a complimentary autograph session. Yes, <laughs> yes you know, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. So anyhow, uh, first hundred people on January the 15th, you buy a passing scene book, and if you would like one, you may have one of those. A uh, quick comment about the Passing Scene book. And uh, this is uh, a compliment to the Reading Eagle Press uh, who did uh, the printing of this current book. Those of you who have seen the book, I'm sure, uh, have been impressed with the quality of the photographs. Uh, between volume 17 and volume 18, sometime during the past year, they acquired a new program uh, to deal with photographs so that the pictures in this book, for those who haven't seen uh, the book yet, uh, they actually look like real photographs. On some of the earlier books, uh, before the technology improved to the point where it is today, you can see the little dots, the half toning, like you see in the newspaper when you look at a newspaper picture with a magnifying glass. In this book, you can't see any half toning. Have you noticed that? The pictures really look like actual, actual photographs. They really could not be uh, any better. The clarity is unbelievable. You can take a magnifying glass and read the smallest print uh, in this thing. It really, they've done a super duper job. This is the best book quality wise uh, because of the new technology of all the books in the Passing Scene series. Uh, it, this really is very good. There are 366 photographs in the Passing Scene volume 18, one for each day of leap year. Um, and there is a comprehensive uh, index. And something that I've liked, that I've always done, uh, and, but increasingly so, there are a lot of photographs with little insets uh, to show the scene as it appears today. Because in years gone by when I had done books and people got these things in their hands and they look at the old photographs, I would frequently get feedback saying, well, what is, what's there today? Is the building still standing? Uh, if it is, uh, what is it used for? Uh, if it's not still standing, what happened to it, and uh, how long ago was it gone? So what I try to do with uh, many of the photographs, here's an example of, uh, of a now and then picture. Oh dear. Oh, uh, yes. You. <laughs> so that you have a... Oh dear. So that you can compare with the scene uh, as it appeared years ago, and the scene uh, as it uh, appears today. This actually uh, shows two old scenes, but basically, uh, whenever possible, I take a current picture of the exact uh, site and uh, I try to get the camera position to be the same as the original so that you really can compare with what was there and um, what is there today. Uh, anything that you want to comment on, Joshua? Um, not that I can think of. I was trying to find one of those um, now and then photos, um, but I can't th oh, you also might want to mention that Doug Reiner, uh, even before the book was published, Doug Reiner, our computer consultant, um, and who maintains our website and our databases for us, he got the index online already. Yeah. So if you go to the library and archive section of our website, you can search by keyword anything you want to look up. If you want to look up uh, Reading Furnace or Bethlehem Steel or Robisonia Furnace, 
Um, that search tool is incredible. It's a comprehensive, a comprehensive index of all 18 volumes. Here's a good before and now and then. Yellow House Hotel. Might be a ooh, there we go. Go for this one, I guess. There we go. So I think, uh, let's see, yep. uh, there's something like 20, what, 28,000 index entries mm -hmm. uh, within the 18th. Probably more than that. That's what I'm thinking. Here's a good, um, the, I know it had been. Yeah. Here's a good before and then, George. Oh, yeah, the Yellow House Hotel then, um, and the Yellow House Hotel as it now appears. Uh, I think that's a viable feature because, again, people want to know. Uh, many of these books are bought by folks who were born and reared in Reading or Berks and then moved to Timbuktu. And the only t uh, communication, the only, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, tie that they have is, is something that they remember in their childhood so that when they uh, see these old time photographs, brings back memories, but they're always curious uh, what's it like today. Uh, and we have many elderly people who just don't get out and around all that much anymore either. Anyhow, let's have a few pictures. If we can switch to the laptop. To the slide that we have. And hit pause at the top right. Yeah, yeah I've been fascinated uh, with Ben Laub for a long time. Ben Laub was the hermit of the Blue Mountains, uh, and there's about a five-page. Uh, feature on Ben Laub. Uh, the Blue Mountain uh, hermit who lived uh, in a charcoal burner's hut. He lived very simply. Uh, last week when it was a terribly cold and the wind was blowing, I couldn't help think of Ben Laub, how in the world he survived uh, because that little charcoal hut that he had, uh, because of the wood shrinking uh, over the course of time, uh, it wasn't very tight anymore, and it really was about uh, a third less of the size uh, as it had been uh, originally. I would say you cut a lot more wood than this to stay warm. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah for, for sure. Uh, he would <clears throat> he would pose for pictures. Mm. He was a poor soul. He really was. Lived by himself uh, virtually all his adult life, and uh, for money, for uh, little odds and ends in the store in Strauss Town. Uh, <clears throat> He would uh, pose for pictures. As a matter of fact, uh, he did that rather frequently. People would go there with a camera, and for a nickel or so, uh, he would get on a picture with the rest of the people. But it's always very funny. Uh, I don't know what his personal hygiene was, but whenever you see a group picture, he's never standing with the rest of the people. He's off either to the left or off to the right, so I'm looking over. Uh, but here is Ben Laub, the Blue Mountain Hermit, uh, who lived from 1865 to 1909. We discovered in doing some research that uh, there were a lot of mistakes made in the past when people were doing little uh, historical sketches of him. Uh, they, they got his age uh, wrong. Uh, thanks to Kim, uh, we, we have the almshouse records, and uh, she was able to find the exact date of his death, and uh, we determined also uh, the year of his birth. He died in the county home, uh, the poor house over in Shillington, the old almshouse, um, on April the 23rd, 1909. I, uh, there's, there's, oh, let me go to the next one. Uh, that is his abode. I, can you imagine living your lifetime in something like that? Put that down. Okay. <laughs> uh, living your, uh, your lifetime in something like that. That was his whole family. Uh, apparently, no, nobody in his family was, was terribly well off. And uh, both he and his dad had used to chop wood years ago uh, for ch to make charcoal. And uh, after the furnaces in that general section uh, closed down, where the old charcoal furnaces were not of operation, uh, he just stayed there. He sort of squatted on land. And even after the land was sold, the new owner allowed him to stay there because, uh, well, he was something of a minor local celebrity in his own way. And uh, he didn't create any kind of a problem. Um, no, 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 that would be me. Oh, I'm, well, that's right. <laughs> but what am I doing? Okay, uh, there's an example again of uh, Ben Laub uh, in his in the woodland north of Strauss Town in Upper Tulpehocken Township. Uh, 
The Blue Mountain Hermit's appearance was such that people would seek out this character with a long grizzled beard, tattered clothing, and shoes tied to his feet with rope. For the latter, he always stood to one side. A series of picture postcards were produced, uh, which brought him a small reward and induced the curious to visit and pay for uh, pictures of their own. Postcards exist showing the inside and outside of his hut. Uh, there was an inside view that I had uh, access to, but because of the old time photography, and it was really dark inside, uh, the inside view wasn't actually usable. Uh, and they would take pictures of Ben doing simple little chores, uh, such as the one that you saw when he was chopping at some wood. His hut did have a small uh, wood-burning stove, a kettle, and a boiler. A ragged quilt uh, draped over some uh, boards served as his bed. As he aged, life became more difficult, as we can well imagine. His exposure to the elements were his uh, undoing. He died uh, at the age of 74. Let's go to the next picture. It's un I have always regretted that I never got uh, to Ida Bond's uh, hotel in uh, uh, near Greenewald. Greenewald was uh, uh, a postal designation a long time ago. There was a covered bridge at Greenewald. There is still uh, a Greenewald bridge that replaced the old wooden covered bridge. Um, Ida Bond was born in 1888 and she lived to 1967. The picture that you see there was taken in 1956. She lives, uh, well she lived uh, at her hotel on Bond Road and it's right off 143 in Albany Township. When you head northward on 143, as you approached uh, the Greenewald Bridge, if you look over uh, to the left side, you'll see this rather large uh, brick building, and that was Ida Bond's hotel. Everyone knew, all the hunters of Berks County knew about Ida Bond, because uh, they would go up there when hunting season opened, and uh, she'd have lots of uh, food prepared, uh, she tells this story about uh, a train would come and uh, sometimes 50, 60 hunters would get off that train. Hmm? Uh, you know, that Berksy train uh, uh, used to, there was a station, a Greenewald station at the other side of the bridge. And uh, they would get off, cross the bridge and come over to her place, sleep in the, in the hotel and on the barn floor so that first thing in the next morning uh, they'd have breakfast that she prepared and they would go out hunting. The Reading Eagle and the Times always sent a reporter uh, during the first day of hunting season to Ida Bond's place to interview her, and she always had a good idea of how many were there and uh, how much uh, they managed, uh, what they managed to shoot. So uh, she was a well-known character, a little on the salty side. Uh, she was a character. Ida Bond's place. The hotel has been uh, closed shortly after her death. And she died in 1960s. Oops. I like 1967. The old, I like the old Seven Up slogans on the cartons back there. Fresh up, Seven Up. It likes you. Uh huh. <laughs> That's Ida Bond. And uh, this picture of Ida Bond was made available to us through the good graces of Marlon Anson and Andrew Dietrich of Dietrich's Meats and the Country Market up in Crumbsville. Good friends of the Historical Society. Good friends of the Passing Scene series. Ida Bond. Uh, in color in the latter days of her life. So would Greenwald be south of um, Lenhartsville? Well, um, where would it be in relation to? Uh, Lenhartsville would lie off, uh, Lenhartsville is on uh, Old 22 and that would lie more to the west. Uh, this is on 143. Would it be north of Virginville or south of Virginville? Uh, north. North, okay. Yeah. Uh, and there is Ida Bond uh, at her hotel. I really struggled to get a now picture, a now picture uh, to accompany this particular view which was taken a long time ago. That's Ida Bond. It was taken in 1956. By the way, but, uh, yeah, uh, that, was, that was my struggle. And actually I did a lot of work on that uh, thanks to Photoshop because you really can't tell it that that faces a woods and uh, right where you see the BCTV on the screen, the woods begins. So that oh, you uh, couldn't get in front of it enough. I couldn't get I couldn't get in front of it enough, so I had to take it from the side, and it really, really was dark. Uh, 
Again, thanks to Photoshop. After a rainstorm, too. Well, no, it was it was a little overcast that day. That that's true. It was a little, shiny. Sure. Yeah, wow. it was a little overcast. But that's the hotel as it is today, and uh, now it's someone's residence. Again, it's off Route 143. Um, near Greenawall Bridge, in which you pass on 143 as you head northward, and it's in Albany Township. Yeah. Uh, Look out for the lo locomotive. Uh, yeah, this, is, this is rather, uh, rather amusing. Uh, <clears throat> we're in Kempton. Kempton, as you know, is, uh, is a small town. Actually, it's more of a village, I guess, uh, up in Albany Township. That little place actually had two competing fire companies uh, a stone's throw apart, and I really mean a stone's throw apart. Uh, this picture was taken in 1930, and it was one of a group of negatives that, um, what was Mr. Anderson's first name? Uh, Anderson Press, uh, years ago, um, was run by uh, a fellow who was a photographer. He published the West Side News and Suburban News. So he had a four by five camera and uh, for all sorts of fire, uh, fire events, he was, a, uh, I guess for a while he might have been president of um, the Riften Fire Company. He was involved there. But anyhow, uh, he went out and took pictures whenever there was any kind of a fire uh, uh, convention. And that's when he took this picture in 1930, because it, it was a big county-wide parade in Reading. And uh, they, they, they took pictures, he took pictures of every fire company in Berks County and every uh, fire company had, building in the city of Reading. So it's quite a collection. We have those on our website, the, oh, yeah. those fire company pictures. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, this was 1930, and we see Samuel Dunkel, the engine driver, in 1930. Uh, that's on the property today of Albright's Mill, and uh, it is today used as uh, a garage. Needless to say, I don't think it lasted much longer than the time that this picture was taken in 1930. But I, I can't believe that they actually had two competing fire companies in that little village, uh, a stone's throw apart one from the other. Next. This, uh, this is the Kempton Hotel, uh, really quite a place. The Kempton Hotel uh, dates from 1874, and you're looking at an old picture that was made from a glass, from a glass plate, uh, and the picture was acquired uh, from, by Anson Dietrich for use in volume 18. That is an old picture. Uh, the whole town grew up because of the railroad going through in 1874. Mm -hmm. And for a while, this was a really, really busy place. Now, in that last picture, you saw uh, that, little, uh, that little fire company building, the community fire company. Uh, in the rear was a very large structure, Bachman's Garage. Uh, and Bachman's, uh, well, he was involved with quite a number of enterprises. He sold automobiles years ago. He also sold all sorts of engines. But anyhow, this was a very busy community at one time. And uh, you're looking at the Kempton Hotel. Um, one of the uh, mainstays of the Kempton Hotel is the former owner, Archie Fulweiler. Uh, nice person, keeps a very nice hotel. The food is wonderful, the salad bar is terrific. Uh, it really is one of the great country hotels. We have some really good country hotels with fine food, and this surely uh, is one of those. Let's take a little break. Uh, Kim, I think you have some things to tell us. Where do we want to start? <laughs> At the beginning. <laughs> um, okay, how about for the month of January, everything in the museum store is on sale at 10%, except for the passing scenes. Uh -huh. If you remember, you can get an additional 10% off except on consignment items and the passing scene. So passing scene is exempt. Just remember that. Um, We'll sure. Um, trade off. Second Saturday is coming up this Saturday, actually. Um, well, January, I should say. It's going to be January 8th, just in case you're watching this program after January 8th. Uh, January 8th, we have our second Saturday programs. Um, this time it's going to be uh, Denise Peters is going to be here from Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. She's going to be joining us at 10 o'clock. We have refreshments that start at 9.30, but she's going to be joining us at 10 o'clock. 
to talk about the history of Hawk Mountain. And afterwards, we're going to be having a live raptor in our auditorium. Oh, my. Um, so that'll be pretty neat. Um, there's plenty of parking available at the Henry Johnson Library parking lot at the back. Um, refreshments start at 930, and there is a small cover charge for refreshments. Um, second Saturday is also Hendel Open House, so mm -hmm. if you have not had a chance to see the Hendel House, we um, ask you to please stop on down. And it's still decorated for holidays, so it's probably going to be just about your last chance to yeah, see, see it. Yeah, see the tree and all, and all of the, I think she's got uh, bell schnickels up maybe. I or think so. There's a lot of garlands. I was just down there today. I'm not don't yeah. remember the bell schnickels. Um, we'd also like to remind you that January 15th and 22nd from 9 to noon and 1 to 3 are going to be the uh, autograph sessions for the passing scene. What were those dates again? The 15th and 22nd. Uh-huh from 9 to noon and 1 to 3 Thank you, with yeah. a break in between. Volume 18 will be available for sale at $48. Older volumes will be in stock. Um, what volumes do you have? Um, I know we have 13 and I believe 16. Um, we'd still have some, the blue covers are 17, so those are available. About 15. Um, so it's, I think we might have 15, I'm not sure. You have some of those, like the uh, Starburst, uh, Sunburst cover. Yes, yeah, we have some of those. So it, it's, it's hard to say what volumes we have in stock because sometimes it just changes on a daily basis, but guaranteed to have 13 and 16 and most likely 17. And 15. And sometimes our um, good friend, um, Oh, I can Larry Ward. Yeah, Larry, Larry Ward. Yeah. Larry Ward with Museum Books. He also has uh, some of the older copies available as well. And, uh, and you know, if they come and look through those things, uh, we also have in the gift shop a, a whole lot of Berks County history books, mm -hmm. ones that are really very difficult to get. And uh, there's a goodly supply there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'll... That. Yeah, we'll skip that. Um, Saturday, February 19th, 2011 is the annual President's Day Luncheon hosted this year by Governor Heaster Chapter of the SAR. It's held jointly with HSBC and the DAR. Lunch at noon is at the Reading Inn. It's $24, I'm guessing, per person. Yep, per person. Uh, speaker Nancy K. Lone. I believe so. Author of Following the Drum, Women at Valley Forge Encampment will be the speaker for this year's luncheon. Um, How do call, get tickets for that? Um, call us. We have the address and um, information to send a check to. So if you want to uh, make your reservations, please call us at 610-375-4375. And then um, if you want to pencil in your calendar or leave the date free, at the end of March, we're going to be sponsoring a trip to Georgia. Um, during the Civil War, a bunch of uh, Union conspirators, some were soldiers, some were private citizens, uh, they conducted an incursion down south. Their goal was to steal a train and destroy railroad track and destroy railroad bridges to hinder the efforts of the Confederacy. They didn't do so well. Um, <laughs> no, they didn't. Part of the problem was they were trying to set fire to wooden bridges. Uh, it had been raining a lot, <laughs> so it didn't work too well, unfortunately. But it's a very well-known story, and it's called The Great Locomotive Chase, if you have a chance to research it. Um, it was popular enough for Disney to make a movie out of, out of it starring Fess Parker as one of the lead oh, yeah. union sympathizers. Um, we're going to retrace the route of the stolen locomotive chase. The general, the general itself is on display, and part of the trip will be to see that engine. And also, it's about a four or five day trip here from the 24th until the 28th of, of March. Um, please call our main number for more information and reservations. But that Buster Keaton film, The General. That's, that was also based on that story. Yeah. Oh. And that's a great film. Mm -hmm. The um, Disney movie is very good. It's always one of, been one of my favorite movies. I've probably requested it so much for the video rental place the tape wore out, but I found it on DVD at Best Buy. So it's, it's a really good movie. Did you have a price on that? Um, I don't have it quite handy with me. Let, let me check the brochure here. There we go. And maybe, Kim, if you want to queue up your high-density photos, we can have a look at those. Um, the reservations are reasonable, uh, $12.95 each, but it looks like we're going to have to take a break here. We'll be right back with you. You're watching the Historical Society of Berks County on bctv.org. Be informed. Be involved. Be a member. For membership information, go to www.bctv.org slash support slash membership. For other information on local heritage societies and local history, go to bctv.org. 
The Historical Society of Berks County on bctv.org is underwritten by the Highlands. To find out how you and your business can support a program on BCTV, go to bctv.org. The meeting of the mind, <laughs> trying to get the computer working. Okay, for those of you who have been outside of the loop, uh, the library has been closed since November 13th while we install high-density shelving. Um, actually, I brought some pictures. As of, when did I leave for vacation? Like the 21st, somewhere around there, December, the shelving is installed and everything's back up on the shelves. Um, what I can do real quick is show you uh, some of the process. Uh, these are what the old shelves look like. Um, this is us trying to fill in space. We didn't realize how many books we had, um, us looking through shelving, empty shelving. Uh, Lisa, <laughs> who I hope she's watching on the floor, stacking books. Um, it, we didn't realize how many books we had until we started filling up the floor. This is a good reason to be closed, right? Yes. <laughs> um, we didn't have any access to really anything um, because and the farther we got in taking the books off the shelves, the less space we actually had in the research room. Um, we were trying to fit books in every nook and cranny. Uh, this is down where the photographs um, are. This is almost right outside my office. And then they came and they dropped off the shelving, which took up all the remaining uh, um, room that we had. Um, Hence, uh, you can see uh, when they, this is when they dropped off the shelving. Um, we had no room, literally. It was, it was a very interesting process. It literally took them six days to, um, they ripped up the carpet. You can see um, them laying the outlines for the tracks. Uh, it was, went really quick. Um, and this is what it looks like now. It's a big change. Um, you can see all the the wheels. It's very easy to move. Um, we have everything spaced out nicely. This is our box storage. We have two separate types of storage in the stack room now. We have the storage for boxes, and then we have the storage for books. Now, um, how much shelving did you gain by that high density shelving? Gain about seventy percent. Seventy percent, at least. Um, the way we have the, uh, the shelving set up now is uh, we have everything kind of spread out so that when we grow the collection, we're not constantly rearranging. Because in, oh, at, be right now, if we, had, if we compacted everything, we'd be literally rearranging almost the entire collection just to create space. So we actually have empty ranges now that we can grow into. So in other words, the shelves are uh, on like a track they, and, and they move back and forth with those handles. The right there. Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> back to the computer. Sorry. You can see the handles underneath the little fine. Some of the systems are motorized. You just press a button. These you just crank over in a circular fashion. But they certainly crank easily. Mm -hmm. They do. And the more weight that's actually on the shelving, the easier it is to move. Because when there's no weight on the shelving, the bearings slip. So they actually oh. need the weight to help. And what we figured out um, is currently we can, and we don't recommend this, and I hope nobody from our uh, storage company is watching, but we can move three shelves at once. It's only three. After three, we can't move the shelves. Mm -hmm. So it really is, um, it's really kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, it, it's very nice, and it's uh, increased our storage capacity. And we would like, again, uh, like to thank again um, the Why a Missing Foundation and the Hollenbach family for making this available. Um, it's really going to do wonders for the library. And eventually, um, within the next couple of years, we'd like to get it downstairs in the basement as well. And then um, I figure, you know, we can grow and start collecting more stuff. When we built the library wing to the original building in 1988, we figured that that would take care of all of our uh, photographs and all of the books for at least 30 years. Such was not the case. And then you built the Henry Johnson Library and I filled it in five months. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Lisa and I, real quick, would like to thank uh, Jeff Fuller at Storage Concepts who helped us uh, pick and uh, provided the layouts. 
our installer, um, Frank and Bob, and unfortunately I don't know their last names. And then a real quick shout out to AG, uh, AJ Blazinski, who provided us with a container for all of the shelving garbage that we didn't need on very short notice. Um, the library is still closed. Um, we have a few more little tweaks not with the shelving, but with the, the building itself uh, to take care of. Um, however, because everything is now put back to where it's supposed to be, um, next week we will reinstate the off-site research services. Um, so if you've been sitting on a research request, um, please feel free to mail it in, but we need to warn you, we've got requests sitting on my desk that have been in since November 13th. Um, so if you want to hold on to it a little while longer, please do. Um, we're going to answer the research requests in the order in which we've received them. So just bear with us and give us a little bit more time. Um, and we also ask uh, until we can finish with research requests and the odds and ends of what we're trying to take care of to still hold off on making donations, we will officially start taking those when the library reopens because we'll have um, places to put them. There's still a couple corners of the library that are a little bit uh, hairy for now, um, but, you know. So there is no tentative date for reopening until you take care of some of those uh, building matters. Issues that have come up since, yeah. and there are issues that started coming up um, while we were open. Literally. But yeah, lit <laughs> the floor. Uh, our floor is bulging. <laughs> Literally coming up. Um, so we're, we want it because I trip on it on a daily basis, and um, we don't want our patrons to trip on it. So we're hoping to have that taken care of this month. So look towards the end of the month uh, for more information on us opening. Um, also, on a side note, if you received our new edition of the Historical Review, you noticed that I did not include the donation list um, in my article Simply this time. Simply with my article, too. Right. Yeah. Um, the library donation list have kind of grown exponentially in the two years that I've been here, um, making it almost impossible not only to itemize everything, but to squeeze it into the space allocated for my article. So what we're going to start doing, and I need to get it to um, Doug Reiner, we're going to uh, actually make, our donate, make the library don donation list available on the website. It's going to be the same in the same format that you get in the review. It's just going to be available in a Word or PDF document that you can, you can actually read. If you don't have access to our website, um, when the library opens, we'll have a copy of it at the front desk. Um, but the, the donation list that I presented to the library committee in October was like 15 pages or more. The one that I presented in November was just about the same, and it's just it's too much stuff to put into my column. Unless we go to eight-point type. Yeah, and then you can't read it anyways. Um, so, but we'd like to thank all of our donors. Um, we don't, please don't think we don't appreciate your donations. You're helping to preserve Berks County history. Please continue to donate. Um, but you can view our donation list on our website. I'm going to put it on our Facebook site and at the front desk in the library. That's all okay. I got. Well, we can go back and have some more pictures. I have to switch. Well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Hang well, on. While we're switching, uh, I'll mention quickly, maybe we can get to some photos or I'll save until next time. Um, okay. As you know, we run about two temporary exhibits per year called short-term exhibits. And um, this past year, 2010, has mostly been an exhibit called Members' Treasures and also the secondary exhibit, uh, but no less equal important, uh, was Monobox Silver. Um, we just closed our Monobox Silver on the 31st. We just want to thank our guest curators, Terry Royal West and P. Allison DuPont, again, for making that exhibit possible. And again, our never-ending thanks to the Berks County Board of Commissioners and also to the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission for helping to make these exhibits possible. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we can do. Um, the exhibit's coming up in 2011. We'll get to it next time. Um, the first exhibit is going to open on Saturday, February 12th. It's going to be our coverlet exhibit. And we also have our racing exhibit, which is going to open up in the mid-April of this year as well. So, uh, If anybody has photographs of uh, dealing with racing locally, uh, can they get in contact with you? Certainly. Um, please give me a call, 610-375-4375. I just talked to a relative who owns a car of one of the very well-known local racers. We're already lining up vehicles 
uh, just a question of squeezing them in the door, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, so next year is going to be definitely proved to be to cut a hole in the wall, or, or <laughs> chop off the ceiling or something to get Come them in, in there. From the roof. Um, so we'll find a way. So we're looking for photographs. Yeah, photographs, um, videos, stories, uh, objects, anything, anything related to vehicular, sorry, vehicular racing in the county. So, yep, vehicular racing. Yep, very good. Okay. Um, We'll take a few of these and then maybe we can break because you have something to show us sure, also. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, we're back. Back in Kempton. Oh, yeah. No more Kempton. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is a really great picture. And uh, I have to thank Marlon Dietrich uh, from Crumbsville for this. We're looking at Chauffeur's Mill along the Sakoni Creek. It fronts on Dutch Mill Road. Some of the older people uh, watching this program probably remember the Dutch Mill. They used to have a campsite there. Uh, it closed a number of years ago, but that was the old mill at the Dutch Mill uh, campsite. And again, it's uh, and to the immediate right of this picture uh, is what is the the Sacconi Bridge. Now oh, you can just see it. I think. Oh no! What you're seeing, what you're seeing there, is part of the dam breast. Oh, okay. uh, there was a big dam there. No, the, the bridge is a rather old one, and it's it actually lies out of the view uh, of this picture, but it would lie off to the right hand side. Uh, that Dutch mill campgrounds discontinued quite a while back uh, was was well known. Uh, it derived its name from the mill scene in the picture, which was probably erected by John Creamer in 1811. It was later the property of David and Isaac Kemp. Maps of 1854 and 1860 attribute ownership at that period to Jonathan Schofer, henceforth, I mean, hence the, the Schofer's Mill. This is from a really, this photograph is really great, uh, one, of the, one of the great mill pictures. Uh, when you go to the site today, it doesn't look yeah. quite like that. Uh, is it, okay, let's have the next picture. Oh, there it is. Uh, that's the same mill today, and uh, uh, we're seeing. Uh, that's the Anson, same direction. Uh, no, go back to the last one. Now, if on the extreme on the extreme left side of the picture, the extreme left side is uh, right around that corner is where Anson uh, is standing. That uh, that is uh, on Dutch Mill Road. Now, the, the tree that you see up in the left, uh, right behind that, would be what you would see in the next picture. May I have the next picture, please? Yeah, he's standing where that big tree used to be. And that is uh, the mill as it appears today. It always amazes me when you see these old pictures and you go to the site. Uh, that's always a revelation to me to find out, uh, you know, just what is there, what is there today. Uh, that, by the way, that old bridge is a four is a four arch stone bridge uh, dating from 1861. It was cemented over in 1956. Okay, the next picture, please. Yeah, this is uh, this is a real dandy. And um, what, what page is that? Can you tell me? Uh, you don't have that down. No. Okay. Uh, what we're looking at there is Henry Heimbach, and uh, I have to thank our good friend Donald Brensinger from Boyertown, and um, David Ramelli also fed into this particular picture. That's a great photograph. That's Henry Heimbach, the jigsaw artist and craftsman, around 1906. He lived in the Sea Saltsville Red Lion area of Long Swamp Township. He's sort of right on the border. Henry made cut-out pictures and lettering to create hymns, poems, and prayers. Uh, and I think we have a picture coming up of some of his artistic work. Yeah, that's an absolutely extraordinary piece of work. That view doesn't really do justice uh, to the original. It's very colorful. And it's, it's incredibly intricate. I can't imagine that he could cut that thing from a single piece of wood. And I saw, yeah, the Lord's Prayer. I saw no piecing, you know, that like he made a mistake and he pieced something in. Uh, I don't see that at all. Um, he made uh, these things out of cast off wood. Uh, he would take old wood home. He worked at a store. And he also, uh, yeah, years ago, before cardboard, they used to send uh, goods to stores in, uh, in wooden packing cases. The wood was rather thin. 
And people used to say that wood years ago for odds and ends. Uh, and that, of course, he used for his cutouts. Uh, Henry specialized in ornamented uh, sewing boxes, curio cabinets, comb boxes, and such things. But this was uh, his, real, uh, his real thing to make those. Uh, I know of two. I wonder whether anybody who's out there in the viewing audience knows of a third one. Uh, David Brensinger has one, and this particular one belongs to our good friend uh, Dave Ramelli from Kutztown. Uh, his, uh, his parents acquired that, uh, I believe, as a wedding gift. Uh, supposedly, Henry Heinbach um, worked as a cabinet maker. Uh, at, the, at the furniture factory in Topton. And um, we don't know a whole lot about him. Supposedly he was married twice and uh, he was, as you would expect, a woodworker. I only wish, this was one of the times when I really wished that we had access, uh, we had the, uh, the availability, uh, the possibility of using color because in the original, that's a stunning piece of work. It really, really is. But anyhow, even in black and white, uh, it's it's very impressive. Well, we'll do the day of the signing. We'll have some magic markers available. <laughs> right. We'll Call your own. Color your own. Call your own. So again, we have to thank David Brensinger, uh, Boyertown postcard collector, and Dave Romaley of Kutztown, also a postcard collector and a good friend, for making this available to us. This is uh, we're at Pikeville. Uh, the Pikeville Hotel General Store, and Pikeville, of course, at one time had a post office. This is the Pikeville Hotel, and, uh, at the time the picture was taken, and it was a general store in 1958. It's located uh, on Mine Road in uh, Pikeville Hamlet, Pike Township. Um, this uh, old records refer to Shoals Store. S-H-A-L-L -L apostrophe S, which was the original designation of the post office here, and it was also Mr. Scholl's store. You know, there were a lot of, well, not a lot, but there were a, a number of post offices in Berks County, like Moan's store, uh, let's have one down in uh, Brecknock, another store. Lorraine. So, what's that? Lorraine used to have their own post office. Yeah, but with but the word store, oh, sorry. but with the store uh, in it. But anyhow, this was Scholl's store. Uh, he must have gotten around a good deal and, and made waves because there are a lot of old references to Scholl's store in, in the history book. And the Scholl was William uh, Scholl. The name was changed to Pike Township Post Office in 1834 with C. Oster in charge. The designation uh, was again changed in 1872 to Pikeville when V. Landis was the postmaster. The office closed along with a whole lot of others in Berks County in 1906 with the coming of rural free delivery. Uh, that wiped out a whole lot. Uh, sh it shattered uh, small post offices all across the nation in point of fact. Uh, when Nathan H. Landis had the combination store, post office, and hotel between 1868 and 1879, he published a notice that read, Dealer in dry goods, groceries, notions, hardware, hats, caps, boots, shoes, glassware, queensware. Uh, this was, well, uh, these were the, these general stores were the department stores uh, years ago out in, uh, you know, out in the boonies. I can remember there were quite a few general stores when I first became interested in history and it was always fascinating. I was, it was always fascinating to see uh, how, how great a variety they had. Usually you went upstairs for dry goods, clothing, boots, shoes, and that sort of thing. And the other goods would... I remember uh, the one at Loboxville, how he had things hanging down on the strings from the ceiling. Uh, it was like walking through a maze when you went in there. But they had like one of, uh, of almost anything that you could possibly want. Uh, this, the post office in general, well, the store closed. Um, in 1971. The present owners of the property, George C. and Karen Rodenbaugh, bought the place in 1972. They continued the hotel until 1976. Today, uh, there's an antique store that operates uh, in this building, which um, hasn't changed a whole lot. Do I have a... Con oh, we do have a next picture. Okay, that, that's the now picture, again in color. That's the way it looks today. That's the, uh, can we go back one again, just... And the we're looking, cobblestone the top of that? 
I'm sorry? It's like it does Yeah, like it looks like they did the big stones on the bottom and then cobblestones on top. Mm. It, it, I think it was um, like a, a design and plaster. Okay. Uh, like a stuck code, uh, a rough stuck code effect. And the photographer's uh, trusty vehicle on the bottom left. Uh, oh, that's right. Yes, indeed. Uh, that was a very exciting day. The people at these road balls are very nice people. Uh, that was a very exciting day because I drove away and left a notebook with some of the photographs for volume 18 in it. Um, fortunately, uh, we did manage to get them back. Um, that was a little scary for a while. You ready for your surprise, George? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, next picture, please. Oh. Or is that it? Uh, we're down to a few minutes if you... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, let's shift gears. Okay. Um, if you'll humor me for the last few minutes here, I'm going to introduce a little segment I like, might like to call the milk, car milk carton portion of the show. <laughs> right here. Yep, right there. Um, we'll start with the first one and pause on that for a little bit. Um, one of the problems we have um, both in the museum and the archives, and this is a variety of institutions from uh, the Historical Society of Berks County to the Met to whatever institution you want to name, we have paintings or we have photographs, we have absolutely no idea who they are. Joshua, one second. Can sure. you lighten that just a little bit? Is that possible to lighten that at the console? Uh, the photo was a little dark to be because I'm not sure if they we have to do anything. There. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Well, I have a few photos here. We might be able to get to them. We might be able to get to them not of subjects. We have no idea who they are, but this is even better. Um, you're looking at what we had to believe, to previously believed to be Henry Melchior Muhlenberg. And we also have his wife, if you want to go to he his wife. He looks like a man, that, like a man of the Certainly. cloth. And if you want to go back to him while I continue my little story here. Um, I was contacted by a museum overseas that were looking to get photos of these for an upcoming exhibit of theirs that was going to travel in the United States and also in Germany. Um, some of our colleagues, since we started distributing these images around, some of our colleagues at a museum down in Delaware um, have called into question the subject of the two paintings. They have a few reasons they cite um, who, why they might doubt who we believe they, we think they are. Um, they said the clothing in particular is not appropriate for a Lutheran minister and his wife. And the style of the paintings is also not one associated with Pennsylvania. Uh, one person suggested Hudson Valley School. And, and they also said they are not certain if the paintings are 18th century or if they could be later copies. Here comes the really interesting part. One supposition is, are you ready, George? Yes. One supposition is they could be Conrad Weiser and his wife, but it's going to be very hard. And there is no, no, and you know, he was a thin fellow with a thin face. There is no known actual photograph or likeness of Conrad Weiser. That's if why that's true, it could that be, would be incredible. Yes, it would. It could be very hard to prove, but we'll, um, we'll see what the future holds. But if we can look at some other paintings here, well, if that's anybody very recognizes anybody, anything, um, this is your great great aunt Tilly or something like that. Please give us a call here or at the Historical Society. Um, one of the volunteer. Now, wait a minute. He looks familiar. That's a late. Oh, he does right there. He looks familiar. Wasn't he one of the Iron Masters? I'm not sure. Um, well, the, one of the places I used he to volunteer familiar. for used to sell some photographs that were access to the collection, but they didn't know who those were either. They ever time. Um, they advertise the photographs as instant ancestors. <laughs> um, this one was by Reeser. It could be Grant, according to the catalog information, but I don't think it. Leo must use us. Yeah, I don't think it matches the well, facial profile. Well, you want to know something? Gene uh, Reeser, who lived on Schuylkill Avenue down below Buttonwood, uh, made a whole series of, of presidential mm -hmm. uh, portraits. Uh, that was his big thing. So it could be Grant, but I don't think the facial profile is quite right. We should um, get little milk cartons and stick their yes. pictures on them. Some of these gentlemen like quite um, like the quite socialized, like this gentleman here. So you'd think we'd have to know somewhere somehow. These are on display down at the Hendel. Um, we thought they were Judge Judge Spade at one point, but um, that is no longer the case. Now we just don't know. That one full face fella really looked like one of the Iron Masters. I've. I'm going to check into that. 
And I think that's the last one, too. Yep. And if we want to, we can have a few look at some images from the Colorado exhibit, sort of a teaser for what's coming up. Um, we're putting together a really nice exhibit called Keeping Cozy, Fancy Coverlets of Berks County. It's going to open on Saturday, February 12th. It's going to be our Saturday, second Saturday program for February. Uh, Ron Walter, uh, who's a noted Berks County coverlet expert and author and also a board member of the Coverlet Museum out in Bedford, will be our guest speaker at 10 o'clock. The exhibit will open afterwards. Um, we have some images on the laptop we can show in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, it's going to feature some really ornate coverlets from all from Berks County from 1830 to 1860. Uh, noted for their bright colors, um, they, the motifs are designs of tulips, birds, and stars that so typify the Pennsylvania German culture of the area. We're going to have about two dozen total. Oh, this is kind of neat. This is the only coverlet in the exhibit. And one of the very few, the only one we found of Berks County, actually, that has a structure on it. It yeah. could be a local scene or it could be just as a design, not sure. Um, so if anybody recognizes the building, please let me know as well. Um, but we're going to have about two dozen coverlets. Um, the neat thing is halfway through, because the exhibit opens in February and runs till the first Saturday in November, about May or June, we're going to put up a new set of coverlets to encourage you to come back. And we just can't display everything in a nice manner. So that'll be a way we can make double utilization of the space. This is pretty, pretty. The colors don't come out too well here on the laptop. But this is a very bold, boldly oh, covered. Oh, Henry Oberlin. Oh, Oberly of Oberly, 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 that's a dandy. Yep. Got some more. Maybe we can squeeze them in the so last minute here. Started over. Hausman in Loboxville. Yeah, that's her. Oh, no, we didn't. No, this is one of the most older ones. We don't know who made it, but it's a very good, I call it the dice coverlet. <laughs> um, it's a geometric, very nice geometric coverlet. But it's 1830, 1860. Um, it just astounds me how the quality and the vibrancy of the coverlets that managed to survive despite the years. Aha. Uh -huh. Tell your friends about our program, which is on live the first Wednesday of each month at 7 o'clock. It repeats Friday at 10, Saturday at 6, and Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Thanks to today's program associates, Joshua Blay and Kimberly Richards. You're welcome, George. Thank you. Thanks, George. <laughs> I'm George Myers of the Ninth, your host and a 51-year member of the Historical Society. We look forward to having you join us again on the first Wednesday in February at 7 o'clock. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.